morning. It's so good to be with you. Thank you for that warm welcome, Dan, honey. Well, that's weird. Why did I say that? Okay. Um, hey, happy Mother's Day. Did, I hope you're having a really good Mother's Day. Did everybody get like their homemade cards this morning and their flowers and maybe breakfast in bed? You're the late crowd, so you really could have pulled off breakfast in bed this morning. Um, for me, my husband asked me to work and my kids gave me a cold. So. Um, we're going to get through this together, all right? It's going to be great. Um, no, I really am happy to be with you this morning. I love the opportunity to get to open God's Word and share with you what He's taught me this week. And you know that we're in the middle of a series called The Good Life, and we are looking at the book of Luke and the different ways that we see the Lord describe the good life. Now, when you think of the good life, what do you think of? Think of like early retirement and yachts in the south of France. Maybe you think of something a little simpler, just maybe a car that doesn't break down or a college tuition that's been paid for. Let me talk to the mamas. I know a good life for you is just eight hours of sleep that is uninterrupted, right? Wouldn't that be so amazing? The good life, it, it certainly looks different for each of us, and, but we know that it, it can be elusive, those things that we are looking for to satisfy us. And so in this series, we are trying to look not necessarily about what satisfies us in this world, but we're talking about the spiritual good life. What does it mean to have a good life, spiritually speaking? And as we've gone through the book of Luke, we, we come now to another story I get to share with you today. We're going to jump right into it to see another aspect, another element of the good life. I get to tell you this story this morning. It's from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 10 is where we're going to be. Um, but instead of just reading right through it, I'm going to go ahead and tell you the story. We're going to add a little imagination to sort of put ourselves in the position to, to really try and get our heads around what was happening in this story. Um, so if you'll go with me, I'm going to tell you the story of Mary and Martha. Have you heard this one before? Mary and Martha, okay, they are sisters, they have a brother named Lazarus, and they live in a town called Bethany. Now, it's important to know that Bethany is right outside of Jerusalem. And so as Jesus came on the scene with his disciples and began his ministry, this proximity to Jerusalem allowed Mary and Martha to oftentimes be the place where Jesus and his disciples would come. And so sooner rather than later, Martha and Mary become a pretty important part of Jesus' ministry as they are the ones that, that host them with their hospitality. And so Martha gets word that Jesus is coming through town again. And Martha's excited. She loves a Jesus visit. But what she knows about a Jesus visit is that there is a lot of work to be done. Because when Jesus comes, there are like dozens and dozens and dozens of people that come with. So Martha, who's the de facto mom in this situation, she sets her sister Mary, probably her brother Lazarus too, she sets him to work. She gives him tasks to do. And you can just imagine, they, they're preparing their home, so they're, they're dusting, they're sweeping, they're moving furniture around so that people can actually gather together. And of course, they're preparing food. Now, sooner rather than later, Jesus arrives on the scene. He shows up at the house. And Mary and Martha, they welcome him in with open arms. They are so happy to have their friend, their teacher, there with them. But right behind Jesus, it's like, imagine like a cartoon, right, where there's like all these people and there's like dust coming up and they all rush into the house and now Mary and Martha are sort of pushed back and they find themselves in the back of the house, they're in the kitchen and these people are just swarming into the other room to listen to Jesus. And so Martha looks to Mary and she sets, gives her some tasks. They, they start preparing and chopping vegetables and herbs and, and getting flour together to make bread. And, and sooner, I mean, they, they, then they've already begun all of these tasks, you can hear Jesus in the other room. Jesus has, has positioned himself to be teaching this crowd of people. And now we, we imagine that Martha's house is probably pretty large. 
And so when I say dozens, I mean, we could have had 50, 60 people that have, have gathered in this space. And so just to picture that. They're shoulder to shoulder around the outside of this room, and then they're, they're gathered in front, and there are people that have probably sort of arranged themselves from the outside of the house, listening in through the window, through the doorway, trying to hear the words of Jesus. And seated close to the front are his disciples, the people that have chosen to dedicate their lives to, to the teachings of Jesus. Now, Martha is no slouch, it should be stated, okay? I mean, her house is great. Her hospitality skill is even greater. She's like the ancient Martha Stewart, minus the prison time, okay? <laughs> And so, I mean, it's like a beautiful choreographed dance, this girl in the kitchen. She is like chopping and sauteing and, and baking and all of these things that are happening. She is, she is bringing together the most beautiful meal for these people who she loves and in honor of the most important person to come into her house. And all of a sudden, she turns around. She asks for Mary to start doing a task, and she realizes... She's alone in the kitchen. You can imagine her like wiping her hands on her apron, maybe wiping the sweat off her brow, looking around, leaning out the window. See, maybe, maybe she went to the garden to get some more vegetables. Maybe she went to the well to fetch more water, but Martha can't find her. She busies herself again with the tasks at hand, and after a while, when she realizes that Mary has not returned, she she takes a peek into the other room. She looks around the corner and she sees Jesus sitting there teaching. And for a moment, she's just captivated by what Jesus is saying. She's reminded of, of what a blessing it is that this teacher gets to teach in her home, that she is the one that has this blessing of having him in her space. And, and she's looking at the faces of the crowd and she's scanning it th to see all of a sudden down in the front, she sees all the disciples and, and seated there right before Jesus is her sister. And it's like, if looks could kill in that moment, Martha is not happy. So she goes back into the kitchen. And now she's pacing back and forth. And I don't know if you've ever been this upset where, where you start to have like an argument in your mind. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like you're like you're playing it through of like what you'd say. This is what I see Martha doing under her breath. She's like, well, why did she, who does she think she is? How could she leave me here all by myself? She doesn't even know what I have to do here. So she is working herself up. And now she's really angry and she realizes that she has no recourse except to tattle on her sister. So that's what she does. Now, imagine this, okay? Jesus is in the other room teaching tons of people. And now Martha has to go in and interrupt him, okay? This is what she says. She leans over, I'm imagining she like, she like gets his ear, he sort of turns to her and, and lifts his eyebrows like a, uh, yeah, what is it, Martha? Uh, even though he's the Lord, so he knows exactly what's going on. Um, and, and she says to him, this is, this is the words that we see recorded in scripture. She says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. <laughs> oh, Martha. Sweet, sweet Martha. See, in this moment, she thinks that she is the one being wronged. She thinks that she's been abandoned, that, that she is just in her indignation that her sister would abandon her. And I think she's expecting the Lord to say something different than what he says. Because this is how Jesus responds to her. He looks at her and he double names her. Do you know what it means to be double named? He says, Martha, Martha. Okay, in, in first century culture, this is the equivalent of when your mother uses all your names. You know what I'm talking about? Like in my house growing up, it was Amy Joy Shirk, why is your room a mess? 
Amy's my sister. I never got triple named, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, that's the equivalent of what's happening here. Martha's being scolded. Jesus says, he says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And that's the end. Credits roll. This is four short verses in chapter 10 of Luke. We don't get a picture of how Martha responds to Jesus' correction. We don't get a picture of what Mary says. We don't even get an explanation from Jesus of what exactly he means. But if I could bottom line it for you this morning, this is what I think the story is getting at. If you want the good life, choose the good portion. If you want the good life, choose the good portion. I know what you're thinking. What does it mean to choose the good portion? <laughs> Right? That's interesting language. In, in some, other past, or some other versions of scripture, simply translate it this way, that Mary has chosen what is better. What Jesus is saying is that her decision, Mary's decision to sit, to listen, to receive from her Lord was better than what Martha chose to do. Now, in order to really understand the impact, the magnitude of Mary's decision to sit at the feet of Jesus, we need to understand the culture that she was in. You know, this past fall, we did a study called Jesus and Women, where our teacher, Christy McClellan, taught us all about the ancient Near East, this first century Jewish Middle Eastern culture, because it's so vastly different from the world that we live in today. And so here's what you need to understand about that culture to really grasp this story. In that culture, women were devalued. They were so marginalized that women were cast aside. When it came to important teachers and rabbis of the day, they were teaching that women shouldn't be trusted, that one rabbi quote <laughs> said this, that the, the scorn of man is better than the kindness of a woman. This is the operating thinking of the day. And so when Mary chooses to sit at the feet of Jesus, this is a countercultural decision. And that phrase, sit at the feet of Jesus, this is not just indicating where in the room Mary is. This is an official designation. The only people that would have been seated at Jesus' feet would have been his disciples who had decided to put themselves under the authority of Jesus and to commit their lives to him. And listen, that position was reserved for men only. And so Mary's audacity to go into that room and to sit at the feet of Jesus shows us something. It shows us that the good portion is available to anyone. The good portion is available to anyone. So you have to imagine that there were people in that room who sort of were gasping when they saw what Mary was doing, this, this cultural faux pas. That was incredible. But, but even more incredible, perhaps, is the fact that Jesus does not refuse her. He does not reject her. He praises her for that decision. So what does that look like for you and me to receive the good portion, to sit at the feet of Jesus? Jesus isn't here, clearly. So what does it look like? I would say this right here is the equivalence of sitting at the feet of Jesus. This is simple, but but what Mary was doing was learning from Jesus' teachings, and that's how we do this today, is by studying this book, by understanding how God has revealed himself to us, by, by hearing the story of God's redemption of his people from beginning to end in Jesus. And this, this is for anyone. I doubt that you came in here wondering whether or not your gender precluded you from being able to read the Bible. I'm sure that that was not at the forefront of your mind. But I wonder, did you grow up in a 
church culture that maybe suggested to you that this was only for the pastors or the church leaders. They were the ones that were supposed to do the thoughtful study and, and you would come and hear 20 minutes of it and be on your way. Listen, this is for you. This is for anyone. This is how we sit at the feet of Jesus and receive what he has for us by, by getting in his word. I love Mary's decision and I love Jesus' response because there can be no question that this is 100% for us. Now, I don't know how long you've been on this journey with the Lord and I don't know your relationship with this book, how you feel about it. Um, but I want to offer to you, if, if you are the type of person that you listen online or you come to church and you, you hear us talk about this, whoever it is up here on stage for 20 minutes, and you feel like you got what you need, let, let me tell you, you're missing out on something more. It's as if you've hired a personal trainer and then you just have them lift the weights. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's good to have a personal trainer. They'll, they'll show you what you're supposed to do. Like, I don't work out. That was bad. I shouldn't have done that. Okay. Um, <laughs> a personal trainer is going to maybe show you how to do things, but until you actually pick up the weight yourself, you're never going to get the benefits of what it has to offer you. And that's what it is. I, I'll tell you that it doesn't matter who stands on this stage and opens this book. There is no greater measure of success for us than to get to explain to you this book, to get to share with you how God has revealed himself, to get to convince you that this is relevant for your life today, and to do it in such a way that you leave and think, huh, I need to check that out this week. This experience should be the starting point, not the finish line. This is a good portion. It's available to you. I love this too about Mary. She shows us that it's available to anyone and she shows us something else that's really important. It's this, the good portion can't be earned. Mary had nothing to offer. Martha is the one working and working and working and we'll get to her in a second. But Mary, she has nothing to offer. She has done no work for Jesus until this point. She simply sits and receives. And in that, I think we see one of the most glorious truths about our faith. Johnny this morning, he read from Ephesians chapter two, and it is one of my favorite verses that says, it is by grace alone that you've been saved. The fact that we have space open to us to come and to know who God is, to have a relationship with him, to receive from him, the only way we have that is because of what he has done for us and nothing that we have done on our own. Amen? That is the truth. This good portion, it can't be earned. Now, I want you to see here that um, we learn from Mary kind of the good stuff, right? Now it's time to look at Martha. Martha. Oh, Martha. You know what? I'm going to start in a positive place with Martha. You know, like, hashtag justice for Martha, okay? Because Martha is not all bad. Martha is, there's something to be admired about Martha. She is a hard worker. She never stops working, and that is a good thing. She's opened her home to dozens of people. Do you know how much food dozens of people eat? It's a lot. And she is generous. She's generous with her space. She's generous with her resources and with her time. And so I, I can just imagine that Martha's like the kind of person you'd want to know. Like in the community, I bet she was known as like, you need something done. You need something for whatever. Martha's your girl. She's going to have your back. She's going to help you out. She is eager to serve. And she is absolutely waste no time in making those that she loves, making sure those that she loves have what they need, right? So when Jesus corrects her, let's pay close attention to what Jesus says. He says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. It's not Martha's work that Jesus is concerned about. It's her worry. 
You are anxious and troubled about many things. There are many things that are weighing Martha down in this moment. She notes exactly which one it is in a moment, but, but many. We don't know exactly what they were, but based on the context of what's happening, I think we can make some educated guesses about what's going on in Martha's mind. First thing is this, obviously there are tons of people in her home and there are lots of things to be done. So the tasks in front of her, all the preparations, these are the things that might be stressing her out. Second thing I think could be the perception of other people. Remember, Mary has committed this cultural faux pas. And in this, in this culture, in this time, if you brought shame on yourself, you brought shame on your entire family. And so Martha could be worried that, eh, what is everybody thinking, not just about Mary, but what is everybody thinking about me, about our family, that we have now done something wrong? Third thing I think is kind of obvious based on what Martha says, she's got some relational conflict going on. <laughs> she says, my sister isn't helping me, Lord. There's some dissension there between the sisters. And anyone who has a sister in here says, you know, that's right. So let's look at this. Let's look at this list here. Tasks that needed to be done, perceptions of others, relational conflict. Do you relate to any of these categories? Any of these things worrying you? troubling you, bringing anxiety to you. Let, let's take them one at a time. How about this? Tasks that need to be done. Let me talk to the moms in here right now. All right, moms. Average day, right? Get up, make the lunches, get the kids to school, make the dentist appointments, go to the grocery store, do the laundry, clean the kitchen, do the laundry, clean the kitchen, do the laundry, clean the kitchen, do the laundry, clean. I get on a loop there sometimes, my bad. Okay, do, then what, you gotta pick the kids up to school, get them to practice, get them to whatever game they have this night. Then you have to make sure you have a healthy dinner and read to them before bed, otherwise they're not gonna graduate from high school. <laughs> it's too much, it's too much. And I don't, I don't know what stage of life you're in, if you're a CEO, if you're a student in this space, but I guarantee you're overscheduled. You're overcommitted. Your task list is unforgiving. And we feel this, right? We feel the weight of our schedule and what's before us, the things that have to get done. We are worried, we are anxious about many things. Let's take the next one. <laughs> Perceptions of others, okay. Well, I think we live enslaved to what people think of us. This looks different for everybody, but thinking about Martha in that moment, when Mary had made this decision to sit at the feet of Jesus, Martha is so worried about how that would reflect on her that she completely misses the fact that while Mary is being countercultural, Jesus is too. <laughs> that Jesus' response to Mary is actually subverting what is expected. But Martha misses it because she's so worried about what people are gonna think. Now, I don't know how that plays out in your life. One concrete example came to mind for me. Um, Whenever I meet a new mom, I'm at the playground or baseball practice for a new team, meeting a new mom and I'm, I'm chatting it up, right? We're getting to know each other and I am dreading the inevitable question, so what does your husband do? <laughs> because I can't tell you how many times I have gotten to that place in a conversation and when I choose to answer honestly, I, I say, oh yeah, my husband's a pastor. And I get this like rise in pitch where people are like, oh, cool. <laughs> and then it's like super awkward for a moment and then they don't quite know how to respond and then soon enough they're like, yeah, we're gonna go play over at this playground. And I'm, I'm acutely aware that they have some perception or some assumption of what a pastor's wife would be like 
Maybe they've had some terrible experience with Christians, or they have some, some issue with God entirely, but this creates in me this desire to like, why am I worried about pleasing them? Why am I not more concerned about the one who sees me and knows me and has made me? So, I don't know, for you, do you feel like that sometimes? You know, when faith comes up in a conversation at work, or maybe like something about society or culture comes up and, and your decision or your opinion has been shaped by your belief in who Jesus is and, and you're afraid to maybe engage in that of what someone might think of you. We are worried and anxious about many things. How about this last one, relational conflicts? I probably don't have to belabor the point, right? I mean, you know what's up. <laughs> We all have these moments in our life where, where we feel wronged by someone, where someone we were meant to trust has somehow betrayed us. We have division and conflict everywhere. Those things weigh you down. We, we are worried and anxious. We can understand. We can sympathize with Martha, can't we? That we are worried and anxious about many things. You know, Martha allowed these things to distract her from the good portion. It's, it's striking to me because if you, if you take these things at their face, they're not inherently bad, okay? Like, the kids got to eat. You got to go to the grocery store. We got to get the laundry done. We, ha we have task lists that need to be completed, of course, and we should work hard to do those things for our family. There are, it's okay to be aware of how people perceive you. You will have relational conflict. That's going to happen in your life. The issue for Martha becomes when she allows those things to become more important than the person in her home. When she has become so consumed by the worry that those things have brought that she forgets to focus on Jesus. Now listen, it's Mother's Day, so I gotta talk about my mom, cause she's here. Hey mom. Um, I would like to set the record straight, there was a little confusion earlier in the service, my mom is the best mom. Just wanted to clarify that. She has multiple cards and mugs and t-shirts and what have you to prove it. Um, but truly, my mom is kind of like Martha, okay, hold on, in all the best ways, okay? She is the most hospitable woman I have ever met. I dare you, walk into Judy's home and see if you will not be met with the world's best cherry bars, complete with the accessorized napkins from whatever season or holiday is most recent. I'm telling you, this woman will do it. She's hardworking. She works harder than anybody I know. Her generosity is unparalleled. She does so many things for so many people, and I admire her so much for that. And listen, she traveled all the way from Illinois to come and be here this weekend. I'm so happy that she's here. And whenever she comes to visit, so much of me wants to repay the favor. Like, I, I want to be that kind of hostess for her and do that kind of work for her. But I will tell you, the moment that I attempt that, <laughs> she's me like, no, don't trouble yourself. No, don't worry about it. Let's just order out. Let's get something easy. Why does she do that? She came all this way not to me to work for her. She's not interested in what I can do for her. She wants to spend time with me. And that's at the heart of Jesus' commendation to Mary and his correction of Martha. That is so what your good father thinks about you. He doesn't care what you have to offer him. He doesn't care what work you can do for him. He wants you. Now, this week as I studied, um, I, will, I will say that it was a bit of a challenge for me in that I was feeling the, the Spirit's conviction that like this is something I need to work on. 
When I sat in the story of, of uh, Mary and Martha, I, I so, so, so relate to Martha. I am squarely in that mom stage where I have the never-ending task list, and it feels like most days there are not enough hours in the day to get it all done. You feel that? I am I'm regularly overwhelmed by what I have to do, and I will say I don't often enough make the time to sit with the Lord, to sit at his feet, to get in his word, and to hear from him. And this week, I was prompted just, and just reminded as I studied this that, that I too often prioritize the needs of my schedule over the needs of my soul. And I don't want to do that. I want to believe that there is one thing necessary, and it's the good portion. And so I wonder, what is it for you? What's keeping you from receiving that good portion? Do you sense that same sort of pressure of the never-ending task list? Is it, is it something that's just relational that's weighing on you, and instead of going to the Lord with those things, you just sort of stew in the frustration and the anxiety? Whatever it is, listen, take the time, sit at the feet of Jesus, receive from him the good portion. Now, I want to be clear that this is going to look different for each of us, right? The way you receive it is going to look different than I do. And now listen, like if you've, if you've never ever like read this book on your own, that's okay. That's okay. But maybe you start, right? And, and if you've never read the Bible before, maybe don't think, I'm going to do this all in one sitting, Genesis to Revelation. Now, we're not trying to be Michael Jordan. We're just trying to learn how to dribble, okay? Start small, but start somewhere. And listen, we've got this incredible app on our, I have to just plug this. Dan's going to be thrilled. Got you. Uh, this Heartland app, I have to tell you, it's a really, really cool thing called The Journey. I don't know if you know about it. If not, you can get, scan that QR code. It'll bring you right there. Each day they will offer you scripture and you can do a little five minute devotional, gets you in the word of God. You can find plenty of daily devotionals anywhere. If you've been on this journey a little bit longer and you're like, I know, I know how to read the Bible, I've been around. Hey, I got a plug this fall, we are gonna be doing a, another Bible study with women. So women, come to Women of the Word, we'll be digging in the Word together. There are plenty of opportunities for you to get into God's Word. But let me encourage you, don't let the other stuff crowd, you, crowd it out. Make the time. And I think if there's one, one thing I want you to see as we close this morning, I know how easy it is for us to be distracted, for us to be deceived into thinking that everything else around us is more important. But I want you to notice what Jesus says when he corrects Martha. He says, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. That simple phrase, one thing is necessary, that ought to be a beacon for our souls. When the demand of our schedules overwhelm us, when the opinions of others weigh upon us, when the broken world burdens us, let that simple sentence bring us back. One thing is necessary. This is uh, how one pastor put it. In all seasons, let the words of our Lord ring in our ears like a trumpet and bring us to right mind. One thing is necessary. If Christ is ours, we have all and abound. Amen.